Hello there. Hello, Mel Fly and Shayna and um, Dinah. You were the first ones up today. I'm so glad you're here joining me today for another fireside reading of Siddhartha. Um, we've been reading this for a couple of weeks now. I'm thoroughly enjoying it. I hope you are too. Um, and it'll be, I think we have another about week's worth of reading. Probably will be finished by the end of next week. So let's see what happens next in the next chapter. Welcome to a fireside reading of Siddhartha by Hermann Hesse. Chapter 9, Part 1, The Ferryman. By this river I want to stay thought, said Arthur. It is the same which I have crossed a long time ago on my way to the childlike people. A friendly ferryman had guided me then. He is the one I want to go to. Starting out from his hut, my path had led me at that time into a new life which had now grown old and is dead. My present path, my present new life, shall also take its start there. Tenderly he looked into the rushing water, into the transparent green, into the crystal lines of its drawing, so rich in secrets. Bright pearls he saw rising from the deep, quiet bubbles of air floating on the reflecting surface, the blue of the sky being depicted in it. With a thousand eyes the river looked at him, with green ones, with white ones, with crystal ones, with sky-blue ones. How did he love this water? How did it delight him? How grateful was he to it? In his heart he heard the voice talking, which was newly awaking, and it told him, Love this water, stay near it, learn from it. Oh yes, he wanted to learn from it, he wanted to listen to it. He who would understand this water and its secrets, so it seemed to him, would also understand many other things, many secrets, all secrets. But out of all secrets of the river, he today only saw one. This one touched his soul. He saw this water ran and ran, incessantly it ran, and was nevertheless always there was always yet new in every moment. Great be he who grasps this, understands this. He understood and grasped it not, only felt some idea of it stirring, a distant memory, divine voices. Siddhartha rose. The workings of hunger in his body became unbearable. In a daze he walked on, up the path, by the bank, up river, listened to the current, listened to the rumbling hunger in his body. When he reached the ferry, the boat was just ready, and the same ferryman had, once, who had once transported the young Samana across the river, stood in the boat. Siddhartha recognized him. He had also aged very much. Would you like to ferry me over? he asked. The ferryman, being astonished to see such an elegant man walking along and on foot, took him into his boat and pushed it off the bank. "'It's a beautiful life you have chosen for yourself,' the passenger spoke. "'It must be beautiful to live by this water every day and to cruise on it.' With a smile, the man at the oar moved from side to side. "'It is beautiful, sir. It is as you say.' But isn't every life, isn't every work beautiful? This may be true, but I envy you yours. Ah, you would soon stop enjoying it. This is nothing for people wearing fine clothes. Siddhartha laughed. Once before I have been looked upon today because of my clothes. I have been looked upon with distrust. Wouldn't you, ferryman, like to accept these clothes, which are a nuisance to me, from me? For you must know I have no money to pay your fare. You're joking, sir, the ferryman laughed. I'm not joking, friend. Behold, 
Once before you have ferried me across this water in your boat for the immaterial reward of a good deed. Thus do it today as well, and accept my clothes for it. And do you, sir, intend to continue travelling without clothes? Ah, most of all, I wouldn't want to continue travelling at all. Most of all, I would rather you, ferryman, gave me an old loincloth and kept me with you as your assistant, or rather as your trainee, for I'll have to learn first how to handle the boat. For a long time the ferryman looked at the stranger, searching. Now I recognize you, he finally said. At one time you've slept in my hut. This was a long time ago, possibly more than twenty years ago. And you've been ferried across the river by me, and we parted like good friends. Haven't you been a Samana? I can't think of your name any more. My name is Siddhartha, and I was a Samana, when you've last seen me. So be welcome, Siddhartha. My name is Vasudeva. You will, so I hope, be my guest today as well, and sleep in my hut, and tell me where you're coming from and why these beautiful clothes are such a nuisance to you. They had reached the middle of the river, and Vasudeva pushed the oar with more strength in order to overcome the current. He worked calmly, his eyes fixed in on the front of the boat with brawny arms. Siddhartha sat and watched him, and remembered how once before on that last day of his time as a Samana, love for this man had stirred in his heart. Gratefully he accepted Vasudeva's invitation. When they had reached the bank, he helped him to tie the boat to the stakes. After this, the ferryman asked him to enter the hut, offered him bread and water, and Siddhartha ate with eager pleasure, and also ate with eager pleasure of the mango fruits Vasudeva offered him. Afterwards, it was almost the time of the sunset, they sat on a log by the bank, and Siddhartha told the ferryman about where he originally came from, and about his life, as he had seen it before his eyes today, in that hour of despair. Until late at night lasted his tale. Vasudeva listened with great attention. Listening carefully, he let everything enter his mind, birthplace and childhood all that learning, all that searching, all joy, all distress. This was among the ferryman's virtues, one of the greatest. Like only a few, he knew how to listen. Without him having spoken a word, the speaker sensed how Vasudeva let his words enter his mind, quiet, open, waiting, how he did not lose a single one, awaited not a single one with impatience, did not add his praise or rebuke, was just listening. Siddhartha felt, what a happy fortune it is to confess to such a listener, to bury in his heart his own life, his own search, his own suffering. By the end of Siddhartha's tale, when he spoke of the tree by the river and of his deep fall of the holy Om, and how he had felt such a love for the river after his slumber, the ferryman listened with twice the attention, entirely and completely absorbed by it, with his eyes closed. But when Siddhartha fell silent, and a long silence had occurred, then Vasudeva said, It is as I thought. The river has spoken to you. It is your friend as well. It speaks to you as well. That is good, that is very good. Stay with me, Siddhartha, my friend. I used to have a wife. Her bed was next to mine, but she has died a long time ago. For a long time I have lived alone. Now you shall live with me. There is space and food for both. I thank you, said Siddhartha. I thank you and accept. And I also thank you for this, Vasudeva, for listening to me so well. 
These people are rare who know how to listen, and I did not meet a single one who knew it as well as you did. I will also learn in this respect from you. You will learn it, spoke Vasudeva, but not from me. The river has taught me to listen. From it you will learn it as well. It knows everything, the river. Everything can be learned from it. See, you've already learned this from the water too, that it is good to strive downwards, to sink, to seek depth. The rich and elegant Siddhartha is becoming an oarsman's servant. The learned Brahman Siddhartha becomes a ferryman. This has also been told to you by the river. You'll learn that other thing from it as well. Quoth Siddhartha, after a long pause, What other thing, Vasudeva? Vasudeva rose. It is late, he said. Let's go to sleep. I can't tell you that other thing, O oh friend. You'll learn it, or perhaps you know it already. See, I'm no learned man. I have no special skill in speaking. I also have no special skill in thinking. All I'm able to do is to listen and to be godly. I have learned nothing else. If I was able to say and teach it, I might be a wise man, but like this I am only a ferryman, and it is my task to ferry people across the river. I have transported many, thousands, and to all of them my river has been nothing but an obstacle on their travels. They travelled to seek money in business, and for weddings, and on pilgrimage, and the river was obstructing their path, and the ferryman's job was to get them quickly across that obstacle. But for some among thousands, a few, four or five, the river has stopped being an obstacle. They have heard its voice. They have listened to it. And the river has become sacred to them, as it has become sacred to me. Let's rest now, Siddhartha. Siddhartha stayed with the ferryman and learned to operate the boat, and when there was nothing to do at the ferry, he worked with Vasudeva in the rice field, gathered wood, plucked the fruit off the banana trees. He learned to build an oar and learned to mend the boat and to weave baskets, and was joyful because of everything he learned, and the days and months passed quickly. But more than Vasudeva could teach him, he was taught by the river. Incessantly he learned from it. Most of all, he learned from it to listen, to pay close attention with a quiet heart, with a waiting, opened soul, without passion, without a wish, without judgment, without an opinion. In a friendly manner, he lived side by side with Vasudeva, and occasionally they exchanged some words, few and at length, thoughts about words. Vasudeva was no friend of words. Rarely Siddhartha succeeded in persuading him to speak. Did you, so he asked him at one time, did you too learn that secret from the river that there is no time? Vasudeva's face was filled with a bright smile. Yes, Siddhartha, he spoke. It is this what you mean, isn't it, that the river is everywhere at once, at the source and at the mouth, at the waterfall, at the ferry, at the rapids, in the sea, in the mountains, everywhere at once, and that there is only the present time for it, not the shadow of the past, nor the shadow of the future. This is it said Siddhartha, and when I had learned it, I looked at my life, and it was also a river. And the boy Siddhartha was only separated from the man Siddhartha and from the old man Siddhartha by a shadow, not by something real. Also Siddhartha's previous births were no past, and his death and his return to Brahma was no future. Nothing was nothing will be, everything is, everything has existence. 
and is present. Siddhartha spoke with ecstasy. Deeply this enlightenment had delighted him. Oh, was not all suffering time? Were not all forms of tormenting oneself and being afraid time? Was not everything hard, everything hostile in the world, gone and overcome as soon as one had overcome time? as soon as time would have been put out of existence by one's thoughts. In ecstatic delight he had spoken. But Vasudeva smiled at him brightly and nodded in confirmation. Silently he nodded, brushed his hand over Siddhartha's shoulder, turned back to his work. Thank you all for joining me. We will read the next part of this chapter on Monday. So we have the weekend ahead of us. I hope you all have a lovely weekend. And I will see you all on Monday. Until then, everyone, do stay very, very well indeed.